Welcome back to another episode of the Morning Buzz. Hi, I'm Russell Gahagan from Russell's Fishing Tech, and today we got episode 13, which might be my favorite episode of all time. We'll see. I've got uh, I've got a guest today that I'm pretty excited about. It is uh, the greatest salmon and trout fisherman in Great Lakes history, uh, George Gahagan, Captain George Gahagan, who happens to also be my father. Uh, how are you doing today, Dad? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. So why don't you give everybody a little tutorial at home real quick on, on your background? Um, obviously, a lot of people probably don't know, you know, that you are a charter captain, obviously, as I mentioned. A lot of the people that follow me maybe do or do not know that. Um, and then maybe explain to them, like, how long you've been fishing the lake, what's your background kind of been? Well, I'm 63 years old. I started fishing the lake when I was about 9 or 10 when my uh, parents would let me go down to the pier. I fished a pier for eight or 10, 12 years, and then my uncle got a boat and he started fishing, got me involved in uh, Lake Michigan on the water in the boat. And I uh, got my own boat when I was 18 and then started chartering around, uh, I don't know, the last 38 years, I guess. And I've been in and out of chartering for mostly, and I guess I did miss a couple years in there, but uh, for the most part, it's been every uh, year for the last 38 years. Okay, and, and back when I was a kid, uh, young, you had your own business, you had two boats, and then now for what, about the last 18 years or so maybe, you've been working for Dumper Dan, right? Uh, last, uh, I think it's like 26 years now, somewhere right in there, I've been working for Dan forever. Dan actually uh, started working for me when he was 14 years old, and then uh, I started working for him uh, for the last 26 years. So it's been a friendship with, uh, plus working. Yeah, I, I know we told the story uh, when I had Dumper Dan himself on uh, the morning buzz. We told the story about how, how and why you gave him his nickname. But it's interesting that it's gone full circle. Dan started for you. Um, now you work for Dan. I made it for Dan. Uh, so it's pretty interesting there. But obviously, being the fact that you've been fishing a lake for basically 50 plus years, um, a lot of things have changed, right? I mean, maybe in like a short uh, two or three minute description you know what is the biggest difference from maybe when you first started your charter business and how you fish the, the salmon and trout out on lake michigan compared to now i mean like what is the big difference and and what maybe are the changes that you see that you've made uh to attack them now versus then well the changes are night and day it's a completely different fishery from when it was back then uh i guess the biggest factor i mean you know it wasn't an overnight switch it was a slowly progressive things changed as he went on but uh, if I had to lump some one thing I had to pick that would be different from back early 80s through through probably early 2000s to now is we used to fish in the 80s and 90s almost exclusively 40 foot and, and shallower most, most almost all of the year. In the early 2000s, we fished 80 foot from the shoreline out to about 80 foot, maybe 100 and now it's we hardly fish inside of there i mean other than the fall for fall salmon and you know there's some times when the salmon set up in that 80 to 100 it's uh you know it's generally offshore or deep you know 100 or deeper but i guess i would call 80 to 120 what 40 foot used to be back in the 80s and 90s but just there was more fish back then you know and, and concentrated and as you get in shallower water it concentrates the fish more it also makes fishing a little more productive when they're biting well yeah and for the folks at home i mean obviously i've been doing this now for 30 plus years and even in that time frame things have changed a lot uh when i was a kid uh, and you would take me fishing or I was a young kid and worked for Dan, you know, the water was obviously had a lot more color to it. I think that was one of the reasons why we were able to fish 80 foot and inside. I was a big part of that 80 and in uh, year class there of the 90s and 2000s. Um, and now, obviously, with the clearing water, it's very difficult to catch salmon inside of 80 foot of water. I mean, you have to have some chop or you have to have some cloud cover or it's a morning and evening bite. Um, we're obviously back in the, you know, 80s 90s and even early 2000s when we had a little bit of tint to the water yet uh you you could get away with fishing all day long and 40 50 60 70 foot but those days are pretty much gone aren't they 
Yeah, for the most part they are. I mean, there are some some straggler times when 40 to 80 foot can be real good, but like you said, it's a it's a picky fishery now, and it's a mainly an early early morning, late evening bite. You're not going to go into a 40 foot area and catch them all day long like you could back in the 80s. That's for sure. One of the things that I think separates you from a lot of the other charter captains and fishermen that I've met along the the way, um, and I think kind of has spiraled down to me, has been innovation. You know, I've always been very proud of the fact that you've been an innovator on on Lake Michigan, you know, especially obviously out of the Sheboygan area, but in general, um, you, you know, it's it's been told to me by not just you, but others that, you know, you revolutionized the, the lake trout fishing here in Sheboygan, if not once, but maybe twice with wire line setups back in the 80s and then fishing lake trout with plugs, uh, you know, in the 90s. Um, and then obviously you were even part of with myself and Dumper and maybe a couple others, really the plastic flasher, uh, you know, push here out of the Sheboygan area again. But, I mean, could you have ever imagined uh, in the 80s and 90s that you'd be fishing with copper lines and big flashers and things like that today, like, you know, back in that time frame when it was primarily a downrigger, dipsy, and spoon bite? Yeah, it's, like I said, it's changed a lot. No, probably not. I mean, I can remember running my first 11-inch flasher a guy from South Dakota brought it to me on a charter, and we called it the South Dakota Slasher, and this was before, really, I had ever, ever seen one before, and even before you and Dan and uh, started running them and stuff, and it was a very short-lived. I lost it after about five fish. It got snapped off somehow, and to be honest with you, it was it worked, but I never thought too much of it. I thought, you know, there was something to it, but I really didn't have it long enough to to go and it was uh, very shortly after that then the, the splasher uh, craze kind of started but uh, yeah back in the 80s like I said you know 80s even into the late uh, early 90s we fished in 25 to 40 foot and we used a lot of uh, crankbaits especially fast tracks I mean we had them on every rod and we don't even hardly ever use those anymore or even fish that way anymore. So it's a completely different fishery from what it was back then. It's actually, I'm actually really happy you just mentioned that because that segues me into something that I wanted to talk about. And I want you to tell a quick story because I think it's a great story about how things have changed as well. So when I was a kid, and then obviously going back to before my time, I'm sure, things were pretty secretive. When I first started working for Dumper, things were very secretive. Uh, Everybody was kind of really hard. It was tough to get information out of everybody. You obviously had a lot of secrets over the years that you kept kind of close to your chest, maybe shared with some other people. Obviously, with Russell's fishing tech now, it's a totally different game. Um, you know, obviously, you got guys like myself, Dan Keating, lots of other prominent fishermen who are willing to share um, their knowledge, and even guys like yourself. I mean, I know you've changed over the years tremendously. Guys will walk up to you right on the dock and ask you how the fishing's been and what's going on, and, and your just total demeanor about uh, what you're willing to share versus what you maybe were in the 80s and 90s is different. Why is that? I mean, do you have, is there a reasoning behind why you're willing to share now compared to then? I think as you get older, maybe you just do it. But I think times have just changed so much. That was one of the things, I'm glad you brought it up, that's one of the things that the one that you were asking, what are the big differences between the 80s or 90s, even early 2000s compared to now is the uh, social media and the Internet. I mean, you know, you can get there's so much information out there that you can gather, you know, with doing at home at night doing your research on the internet, which back in, back in the 80s and early 90s, you really didn't have that. You didn't get that information. The only way you got it is either went out, practiced it, or someone showed it to you. So information was a real slow process. I mean, things took for years. I mean, you know, we could I could have a hot setup that might last two or three years, where now a hot setup might last two or three days. You know, the information is just out there, and everybody, you know, there's no secrets out in Lake Michigan, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's really a good thing. I think for the average guy that has a boat in his garage and fishes walleyes in spring and, and transitions into salmon fishing during the summer, it's a fantastic thing because he can gain all the knowledge he's willing to, you know, to get or want off the Internet and, you know, social media. Whereas back in the, in the 80s and 90s, he may go down to the boat landing and he talked to a few guys at the boat landing, and if they weren't willing to hand him any information, he really was on his own.
Yeah, obviously, it probably took you for a while to get used to the fact that your son was basically telling everybody everything. Because uh, even as a kid, that wasn't that wasn't the case, right? I mean, for guys that maybe don't know us or don't know my background or our background together, you know, you brought me up fishing the MWC walleye circuit. We were obviously fairly secretive in that. We we shared some information with some other teammates, as we call them, but that was it. I mean, we weren't going to the tournament, uh, you know, captain's meeting or or the day one. Uh, uh, everybody gets together and weighs in their fish. We weren't telling everybody what we were doing by any means. So um, things have changed dramatically over the last 15 years. I would assume that probably took you a little while to get used to that. Yeah, it does. And I mean, I can tell you right now, if I had a quarter for every time in my mind, I thought, what is he doing telling everybody all this stuff? You'd probably be a millionaire right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I believe it's, it. you know, but I've learned that that's kind of the way of the world right now. And I mean, it's, it's a good thing in the end, but, it wasn't back then. I mean, you know, really back then you had to really, really either, you know, go out and do it or get lucky and have someone that's going to feel sorry for you and help you out or, you know, because things that were earned out there back then just weren't, they weren't uh, shared. I mean, they just weren't. Now it's, everything is shared. And I think that's a good thing in the long run. I mean, everybody, like I said, the weekend average fisherman that doesn't get it, doesn't have an opportunity to spend days upon days and you know 10 hour days three four five six days a week trying to master the craft or whatever can go on to the internet and gather so much information to help him go out on his weekend that he's worked all weekend long wants to go out and catch a few fish and and the things that you do on your like your videos and stuff are extremely helpful to those people and i think that's a good thing in the end because everybody needs to enjoy the fishery well, you mentioned something that I wanted to talk about for a second, too, just to give you kind of a little props because I'm proud of it, and I think it's uh, quite the accomplishment. Um, for people at home who fish or hope to fish once a week or once a weekend or twice a weekend on a busy weekend, you've been working for Dumper now for about 26 years. For probably about the last 20-plus years, you've been running somewhere between 175 and 220 trips a year. For those of you at home that don't understand that, those are half-day charters with an average of about five hours. Is that pretty accurate? I mean, is that what you're doing on an average year? Yeah, that's very accurate. That's right on the money. I mean, for, again, for those at home, that's 175 to 225, and I would say probably 15 to 20 of the last 20-plus years. 15 to 18 of them are probably 200-plus. Other than a bad weather year or something like that, I mean, you're scheduled basically to run 200-plus trips a year. Yes, and we've had a couple bad weather years in a row now, and we're hoping to get a couple good ones. And, you know, hopefully everything balances out in the end. But, yes, that's uh, – I don't – I think I've maybe had one or two in the last 20 years that aren't 200 trip years. So for people at home who maybe don't realize – when we talk about this information and how we give it out for free um, and we try to help people catch more fish, a lot of this information is coming from yourself, myself, other captains who are spending basically half of their life on the water. I mean, that's really what it's been for the last 40 years for you is you've spent almost half of your life on this on this planet on the water Um you know, trying to uh, trying to catch salmon and trout, and you learn these things, and and we help other people catch some fish. So, let's talk a little bit about the setup on a dumper and boat. So, so let you know how how when you're going out on a charter, what is the average amount of rods you're running? Now, that's going to be vary a little bit depending on what species you're targeting. But what is the average amount of rods you're running, and what types of rods meaning like what applications downriggers dipsies boards you know what what types of setups are you running on an average summer trip so nothing crazy not a fall king run or not a, a specialty brown trout setup i'm talking you're going out in june july and august and going to fish that 80 to 200 uh for a mixed bag fish probably 11 to 15 rods for me some of the other guys that run the dumper boats may run more but I'm a, I've been a firm believer over the years to, uh, I like to run a few less rods and make sure those rods are presenting themselves the way they should be versus saturating a column and trying to get, and you're dealing with wind and current and tangles and stuff. And I just, I always felt that a few less rods ran the way they should be in the long run, I'll out, outfished a, a larger amount of rods and half of them were tangled or not running correctly. So probably between nine and fifteen for my boat, anyway. And what's your what would be your average spread then? How many downriggers versus how many divers versus how many boards? 
we have three downriggers we'll probably run. Now, for all the season, the center rigger, which is always usually our deepest rod, is always out. Now, depending on what we're running and where the fish are, we may or may not run the uh, boom riggers, but for the most part, we do. If we're out in open water, we'll run them. And then we'll run four sets of divers, or I should say four divers, two sets, and inside and outside. And anywhere between two and and four boards on a side, you know, depending on weather, obviously dictates how many boards you can run, what kind of, you know, if we're using copper, or we're using uh, lead core, or we're using uh, just braid, you know, will dictate how many rods I'll run on a side. If they're heavy, heavy, you know, copper lines that we're trying to get down real deep on, I very rarely ever try running more than three boards on a side. Uh, we're running just braid and we're running up high for steelhead. I'll put four out, maybe even five on a super calm day. But generally speaking, I run three boards on a side, two divers on a side, a boom downrigger, a center downrigger, and obviously the other side of the boat will have three boards, two divers, and a boom downrigger. Now, one of the major changes on this fishery in the last 10 to 15 years, obviously, and you touched on it earlier, is there's less fish in the lake now than there was 30 years ago. No doubt about it. I think it's on a turn now coming back a little bit, but it is definitely less fish. And and the main less species has been the king salmon, which is probably the most targeted fish. Uh, the one fish that there is a larger volume of, of at this time is the lake trout, which is one that I've talked a lot about in my videos and sort of taught people how to catch. And I learned most of what I know on how to catch them from you. But even that's changed in the last five years for you and I. Five years ago when I was fishing tournaments, I was exclusively fishing metal dodgers and spinning glows. And now uh, it's almost exclusively cowbells with spinning glows, a little bit of metal dodgers. Walk us through a little bit about lake trout fishing. Give us five minutes here. What do you like to run in that 60 to 80? What do you like to run in that 80 to 100? And what do you like to run outside of 100? And maybe give the people at home where you would run what. Because I do think that if there's anybody on the lake that I would say, you know, I would go to for lake trout advice, it would be you. You're probably the best lake trout fisherman I've ever met. Um, you've taught me a lot uh, over the years. So let's share a little bit about that for home people at home. Well, generally when I'm fishing uh, 50 to 80 foot, 90 foot of water for lake trout, I'll use generally only one set of cowbells, and I will run two two uh, metal dodgers on a, on a di uh, on each side on divers so I'll have four metal dodgers and usually one set of cowbells out if it's a if it's a calm day no current I may run two but generally just one and that seems to be it works out extremely well for me uh, once we get out past 90 foot we start to get in that 90 to 120 foot you can get the divers down there but you start getting out so much line that generally I have put maybe one down instead of two on a side to, uh, so not to get the tangles and, and try and keep it a little cleaner and I'll still I'll go to a I'll still keep the one cowbell down the center there are times when I'll run two up to three but very rarely I generally just run the one uh, and outside of 120 feet, you can run the Dodgers. We had uh, the metal Dodgers. We had plenty of years out deep, 300 feet of water, where we just killed them on metal Dodgers. I don't. I've gotten away from that a little bit. It's still very effective. A lot of the guys still use it, and it works. But generally speaking, when I get out there, I usually only run one one rigger for uh, down deep on it with a cowbell system for uh, lake trout. And there's even times when if it's a real it's a real dominant steelhead bite, you're tr you're going so fast that I'll just not even run it down there because it's just you know it's trying to run it down that deep and it just becomes kind of a pain in the butt. So I'll just uh, jerk it off. But what uh, what I've learned most of the time, what the biggest secret for me was cowbells. Is I just made this comment to a couple of the other captains the other day, and I they said you know I said most guys don't carry a lot of cowbells. They'll have one or two setups and that's it. And I said, I mean, I, I carry, you know, quite a few and I use different ones on different days with different, uh, different conditions. And they kind of looked at me and started laughing. Like, you know, most guys have one set of cowbells. It's their hot set of cowbells and they run it no matter where, how, when. I don't do that. I have sets of cowbells. The smaller blade cowbells are super effective in 60 to 90 feet of water. 
I feel once you get out past 90 feet of water, I go to a little bigger blade cowbell. It draws a little more attention as it's getting down there deeper and it seems to be more productive. And I've also learned now that when I get out in the super deep water, they all work, don't get me wrong. They all work out you know, on all these depths, but I just found that some work a little better than others. I'll start to go when I'm out in 300, 250, and I'm running it way down there, I, I found that using the extra large cowbells seem to work much better than the smaller ones. So I have like three different sets and I kind of use them by, by uh, depth of water, but not only depth of water, but amount of current. If current's heavy, I'm gonna use a smaller, smaller bladed cowbell just because it's a little less pull. Obviously you start getting into the bigger blades, they pull pretty hard. And when you get a lot of current, it's hard to keep it efficient, you know, efficient the way it should be. So I use that, that comes into effect also. Well, and that, and that's really the same thought process that I use when salmon fishing with flashers, right? So like 80 or above, you know, top 80 foot of the water column, I really like eight inch flashers. I get in that like, you know, 90 to whatever down, I start to mix in 11 inch blades and start to mix, mix in the bigger fish blades. And really it's the same thing you're talking about. And I, I agree with you hundred percent. I fish salmon candy cowbells, the smaller ones primarily, but I absolutely have some older sets of bigger bells, the old Lure Jensen ones and that, that are, you know, three times the size as the salmon candy ones. Now, are they as fun to fight the fish on? No, because they pull like a Mack truck. But when you're running a charter boat, like we are on Fish Stick or you are with Dumper Dan, you know, our job is to put fish in the cooler, uh, get the customer on the rod. And I, I would agree with you, they are more effective. Um, what is the lead length that you prefer from the cowbell to the spinning glow? Do you have a one certain length or do you mix it up a little bit or... You know, I mix it up a little bit now, but uh, when I first started using them, I was uh, just, it was, it had to be 15 inches. It couldn't be 15 and a quarter. It couldn't be 14 and three quarters. It had to be 15 inches. I was convinced that that was the magic number and it worked the best. Now I'm kind of, i uh, been playing around with a lot of different uh, lengths and 24 inches seems to be a, a pretty standard length that works. It works uh it works, seems to work just as good as the 15 inch and I have them in both and I run them in both. Again, I let the fish decide. There's days out there that I just, they don't seem like they want the smaller bells or they want, they want the bigger ones or vice versa. I think a lot of it has to do with current, current and noise under the water. I mean, you know, you're not, I'm not talking wave noise because obviously 120 down, I don't think there's a lot of wave noise, but I think there is a lot of current noise. And I think that that makes an effect on the bigger bells versus smaller bells, you know, and, well, you know, making more racket sometimes draws their attention versus sometimes it may uh, turn them off, you know, if they're a negative. But generally 15 to 24 inches, I like anywhere in there. I honestly don't think it's a set rule that I have to have it, that you have to have it. I have 24 inches, I guess, if I had to pick one would probably be it. But I have caught literally thousands and thousands of trout on 15-inch leads. But 15 to 24 inches seems to be the seems to be the magic mark. I generally generally I had lately the last couple of years have been just tying them at 24 inches. I don't think people realize how many lake trout you catch on a center downrigger in a season with cowbells. How many I've caught in the last how many years? How many of some of the other cats? I mean, you can have a lot of fun and add a lot of fish to your catch, whether you put them in the cooler or you let them go or whatever the case may be. You can have a ton of fun dedicating one rod with one setup on a daily basis. Um, I mean, just throw a number out there. How many how many lake trout do you think you caught on your center rigger last year if you have to just had to throw a round number out, that one rod? Boy, I honestly, I, I mean, this is a total guess, and I could be wrong, but I would guess somewhere over a 1,000. That's, yeah, and that's I mean, what I, just, yeah, I, I don't think people realize that. Again, now you're, you know, you're running 200 some trips, but you're, I, that doesn't surprise me at all. I would say that, you know, we average when we run them four or five, six, seven bites a trip. So, you know, that's pretty normal. And, and obviously you're out there all the time and out there at some peak time. So on some days you're going to get eight or 10 bites on that one rod. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. To be honest with you, Russell, if the trout are in an area and I'm fishing, you know, in that area and they're somewhat biting, I expect to get somewhere between seven and 12 bites in a four, four hours of fishing on, on just that rod, on okay. just that rod alone. I do mean, you, it's... Do you have a particular color of cowbells that you per, you prefer, or even, even if it's not a specific, I mean, if it is a specific color, great, but even if it's not a specific color, 
maybe like you know do you prefer yellow or green or blue or silver or gold i mean do you have you found anything better than the next well i think uh like the uh, antifreeze type green has always been good, but to be honest with you now, after fishing them for so many years, that I think any color works as long as it's either uh, gold or silver. Okay. Hammered. Right. So gold or silver yeah. hammered base blade, and then you can put different color tapes on them to get them to right to get them to work. Right. You want a silver or a gold type of hammered type blade, or you know smooth, but or you can you know with the prism tapes you can put a hammering effect onto the tape. But uh, that's what I like the best. I mean, if it's silver or gold, it seems to work quite well. Um, I don't. Well, I have never had a lot of luck with like straight glow blades that were you know completely glow. Yeah. Now, I've had extremely good luck with silver blades with some glow on or gold blades with some glow on, but not a, a straight glow blade. You would think that would be the greatest thing in the world when you get out deep and down deep, but I have not found it to be extremely well. I stuck with what I have caught, and they've always seemed to work. Well, I think the sunlight penetrates down more than we think it does. That lake has gotten so clean that I just think that, you know, you get more sunlight down there than you think. Um, one of the things that is really hard to pass on, to weekend anglers through my seminars or that that you've taught me over the years and i have I, you know i have to admit i've been blessed to have you as a dad and teach me a ton of things but also i've been limited on my opportunities to fish with you because you work so much and unless i mate for you i don't get a lot of chances to, to fish with you but when i have been able to well exactly we've had very limited opportunities there but i did mate for you one entire summer uh, going back probably about 15 years now or so. And one of the things you taught me that summer that I, I, I really didn't pay attention to previously that I pay attention to every time I go fishing now and has been critical for me is where and how you set up the boat. So many anglers power out and give almost no thought to, you know, they're, they're thinking to themselves, okay, I heard they're biting in 100 to the north. So they just point it north and go to 100, but they don't pay attention to anything else around them, nothing. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of lead you into this and let you take it, but, you know, you taught me other boats that are around where you're going to set up. What direction are you going to set up and why? Why are you going to set up and go that direction? Um, your number one thing you don't do right away in the morning is set up going into the waves. So maybe talk about some of those kinds of things, why you pick a spot. When you're powering out, you know you're setting up in 80 to 100 or 80 to 90 just north of Sheboygan. That's not the question that we're talking about. Exactly where, on what troll, and why. Maybe give people at home who don't know what to look for an idea of what they should be looking for. Well, that's a kind of a two-part question, and I'm glad you asked it. Uh, one is... Obviously, there's a difference between fishing during the week and fishing on a weekend. Let's say you want to, you know, the fish have been biting in a hundred foot, and like we talked about earlier with all the uh, social media and that, it's not a secret. Everybody that goes out and does any little bit of research will find out they're biting in a hundred foot. Been the best the last few days, so a lot most of the guys are going to head out there. The biggest thing I'll do on a weekend is I uh, more than even going into the waves or not and going with the waves. Uh, or going directly to that or setting up a little short is I kind of try and look for an area where I can get my lines in a clean section of water, which I think is so important. I mean, you, you're in there for the early morning bite or hoping for an early morning bite. Some days they don't bite early, but, you know, you're hoping for that early morning bite. And the last thing you want to be is in a pile of boats turning and maneuvering around other boats. You try and want to find a pick a spot. Like you like you were mentioning, we go north. I'll pick my spot to north. I mean, I, have a, I might have a number punched in, but I rarely go straight to a number. I'll generally fish an area. I don't believe that it's going to be that exact number is going to be great the next day that was good that day. That area might be good, but I'll pick a spot where I can get a clean section of water or try to, where I can get a pass trolling with not someone, you know, right directly in front of me or me cutting back and forth trying to get around boats. You know, I just, I think that the best thing to do in that early morning bite is to get a clean patch of water for you to troll. Now, during the week, it's not near as bad. Normally, the traffic's not that bad, so you can actually, you know, you don't have to worry about so much about whether you're getting a clean 
patch of water, you can kind of look at, you know, what are the wave conditions? Can I put them in going with them or should I, you know, put them in going uh, into the waves or putting in with them? You know, you want to troll north, but the wind's out of the north. You want to actually try and troll into them. Do you want to try and power up and come back? A lot of what I'll, I'll make that decision with is also current. Current makes a huge difference, as you know. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but the current makes a huge difference. There are days when you just can't get them trolling against the current. You can only get them going with the current. And, I mean, it kind of tips you off and tips you off and, uh, you know, how, how much wind have we had previous to that day? Has it been blowing out of the northeast for, you know, fairly hard for the last two or three days? Well, you can expect a heavy north current going south, so I'm going to go further north and try and come back with them or come back to the south, whether there's waves or not, to try and go with the current. And uh, we just, uh, there was a comment made just to me by one of the other captains. They were talking about, you know, coming out and fishing the gap in the fall, you know, and they always like, oh, I was hiding over here and, and nobody knew it. And then you finally found me and they said, you always went to the north. And I said, I don't always go to the north. And they're like, yes, you do. I said, I never go just the one north. I said, I generally fish where the wind blew the day before. If it was a north wind, I'm going to fish set up and troll south out of the harbor in the dark because I'm assuming the mud water got pushed to the south and that's what I want to be in when that sun comes up and the fish are biting and it's too early to really tell and it's dark out out there where the water is. So generally that tells me on which side of the heart, you know, if it's been blowing out of the south hard all yesterday afternoon, the next morning I'm going to fish the harbor, I'm setting up and trolling to the north, north, northeast. So I'm in that mud water when that sun comes up because, you know, in the fall, as you know, it can be on for a half an hour and be off for the rest of the day until the sun sets. Absolutely. So those of you that maybe aren't following at home, the gap, as my dad calls it, is the harbor area just outside the harbor. And what he's talking about when he's talking about mud water is the Sheboygan River is dirty. We call it mud water. It, it's a dirty, muddy looking. It's actually a coffee colored, kind of torquey coffee colored um, water when we have a natural river water pumping out into the lake. And as my dad just described, the salmon in the fall time will like to hide in that dirty water because the bait fish will also hide in that dirty water. Um, they're also a little easier to catch there because you can fool them uh, and they aren't as spooky as they are out in the clear water so what he meant by saying if the wind was blowing out of the north the day before if you can imagine the harbor comes straight out and the mud water comes straight out but you get any wind it'll point one direction so if it's coming from the north which is this way as i'm sitting here looking out at lake michigan right now um as i am uh you know a north wind will blow the mud water and get it pointed this direction so what he's saying is he sets up north of the harbor and trolls south for his first pass which he thinks will be a good pass right away in the morning and make sure that he spends a bunch of time in that mud water now if he'd set up and troll north he might spend three quarters of his time out in clear water where the fish might not be and might not be biting um, which is really important but i think all of that makes just as much sense in the lake out in the lake and it's why i almost never under any circumstance set up going into the waves now there might be a rare case but in reality i think especially for people at home who are fishing in a 16 to 20 foot boat very very rarely would i give anybody the advice to set up and troll into the waves on the morning set number one it's much more difficult to get your rods in and you taught me that more than anybody. but even in a 28 foot baja it's very difficult to set your rods for two guys if you're trying to troll into a three or four foot wave and number two it's not very easy to catch fish into a three or four foot wave, even in a 28 foot boat. We talk about that all the time. You have customers who aren't uh, used to the conditions, things like that. So ideally you would like to spend the first, what you would consider the peak bite while they're biting, going a direction that's comfortable that everybody can catch fish. Would you agree with that? No, oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, and just like you said, I mean, a two to three foot wave, even in a 29 or 30 foot boat you're going to it's you're going to get bounced around it's harder for people to stand up it's just harder to do everything so if it's choppy i mean i'm at all i mean and when i say choppy i mean anything that's going to be bouncing the boat around at all i'm going to be putting in with going with them because it just makes everything so much easier the boat is not bouncing around it's easier to set lines you get it done quicker i mean it's just and and you as you as you uh touched on if you're in a 16 to 18 or 19 20 foot boat walleye boat 
I would never even think about trying setting up going into them. It would even be ever be a ever ever would even be a thought. If there's any kind of a wind or chop of any kind, I'm going to be trolling with the with the wind. And to be honest with you, in that kind of boat, and I'm fishing six to nine rods, I'm going to make a pass to how far ever I'd like, and I'm going to pick them up and go back just because it's going to be that much easier and much enjoyable, and you're, it's much more productive trolling with the waves than it is in them. Yeah, you just touched on the subject I was just going to go to next, or that second part of that, which is we've spent some time fishing in uh, your 619 Ranger. We've spent some time fishing in a 21-foot center console Rabalo I had. And in those types of boats, uh, my buddy Matt Clinton Skeeter, my other buddy's 21-21 Warrior, anything over you know one to two feet, in my opinion, you're just much better off making a pass with the waves, picking them up, powering back up, and make another pass. The 20 or 30 minutes you might waste picking them up, powering up, and resetting, you'll be that much more productive in a four, five, six, eight-hour fishing period going with the waves when you can be uh, not only get, get bit with more of a consistent speed, but let's just be honest, you just got a better chance of landing the fish when the boat is being you know, more stable and more consistent than when you're constantly bouncing up and down and banging around. Yes, exactly. I mean, you know, when I said that sometimes I'll troll in them, you have to understand I'm in a 29-foot bolt with an autopilot that holds relatively well. I mean, I can troll into a two- to three-foot chop, and that autopilot holds the boat straight as an arrow while we're back there setting lines or taking care of things. So, I mean, that's not it's not the same, you know, for a 16- or 18-foot boat trying to do that. That's why I said if I had a... 21 foot or less boat that's you know and, and there's nothing wrong with that boat i'm just saying that it's much more comfortable and easier to do things when you're trolling with the waves versus in them and if i had a boat like that i'm out there fishing i'm going to be setting up trolling with the wind or with the waves oh we talk about that all the time i think the guys at home with an 18 to 21 foot boat have a huge advantage over charter boats in a lot of cases and then obviously when the lake is choppy um you know and it's not favorable seas you know the charter the charter size boats the bigger boats have an advantage over the little boats but you know you're not going to run 20 miles north of sheboygan if the hot bite is there uh, on a charter it's just not feasible for you guys not 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 even necessarily economical it's just not feasible time wise but a guy in an 18 to 21 foot boat with a 200 horsepower motor you know if they're biting 15 miles north of sheboygan he's there in 20 20 30 minutes you know he can get up there and fish so all sizes of boats have their advantages and disadvantages but that's really a key thing that i don't think is real sexy and exciting to talk about but can really add a lot of fish to your season next year if you just pick sort of pick and choose the right area to set up on a daily basis you will catch a ton more fish um next thing i want to talk about is we i hit on before innovation and that's something that you know i'm proud of the things that i've innovated over the years i'm proud of the things you've innovated over the years i've made it known to many people that um probably one of the most revolutionary things in my fishing game uh has been you know flashers and flies and it's been you know a lot of it's been the salmon candy uh you know interchangeable fly system which was your idea talk a little bit to the people at home why that interchangeable fly system is so important so they can get somebody else's take other than me uh my take for it but obviously it was your idea you're a believer in it you use it every single day why is it important for you and why should everybody at home understand why that interchangeable system could help them catch more fish well the biggest thing and i think this is that you know and i'm a firm believer in this and you know i've tried I've tried not to be, but it goes back to that. And I've, I've seen it over the years so many times, and I've seen mates that I've proved it to mates so many times over the years. A fly is great, but it's also the hook and the beads. And there's a thing about getting the amino acids on the, on the hook or getting it, as we call it, broken in. And, you know, you can switch a fly when it's getting a little later in the morning. Now you want to put a different fly on. I'm a firm believer that... Putting a fresh one out of the box is, unless the fish are really biting, you're not going to catch anything on it. Now you take that same bait, that same fly that's been catching fish, slip the fly off, put a different colored fly that you want to put on with that same hook that's been working and the same beads that were on there with the same leader line that has all the uh, proper scent on it, put it out there, you're going to catch fish. It's going to overpower the newness of the fly, in my opinion. I mean, I've gone back to years, I can remember I had a mate, probably 15, 18 years ago now, and we were running 11 inch on a center rigger for salmon with a white flasher with a glow fly from, uh, and it was just on fire. I mean, it was just ridiculous. We, it was a wrecking machine and he busted the hook. 
he busted the hook when he was unhooking the fish and he goes, I busted the hook. And I'm like, and he didn't just bust one. He busted two of the hooks off. So there's only one hook left. There's no choice. You got to change it. And he's like, just change it. It's not going to make a difference. I still have that flasher in my tackle box with a new hook on it. That's never, ever caught another fish in its history. And that was 20 years ago. It's just unbelievable sometimes. I mean, people just, I mean, they laugh at me. They're like, there is no way that makes a difference. And I'm like, it makes a difference. I mean, you know, me and you know uh, things we call breaking in certain, we'll be breaking spoons. You might be fishing a tournament. You want you want a broken in harness on a plug to fish the harbor mouth area. You know, you want a flash or fly that's a proven combo. You set it aside. You know that, you know, it all works. You're not going to take that on the first day of a tournament and take and put a brand new hook on a brand new fly on it to start out. You may be forced to do that later on if you snapped it off or something, but you're not going to do it willingly. I think that that makes such a big difference and like i said by able to take that fly off at eight o'clock in the morning you want to put a shinier fly take the glow off and now you slip that fly off and put a new fly on there but your the beads the leader the hook that's all been working is still on there you're going to catch fish on that versus if you put all brand new on good luck i don't you know you got to catch them when they're biting to break it in yeah, it's amazing always when I give seminars how many guys look at me sideways with that deal. And then the next year when I see them at something, they're like, Russell, you know, I I, I rubbed my, my fly all over, you know, my hook and, and beads and fly all over a fish. And then I, I hung it up and I put it out there and it caught fish right away. You know, they, 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 they see what we're trying to explain and see that it's actually for real. Um, it's really crazy. And, uh you know, it's something that you've obviously taught me. We've learned over the years, uh, and it's a really important factor. Um, maybe let's talk for just a second about some of your favorites over the course of the last year or two. Um, and this will test you a little bit, Dad, because I know you're not always really care about the names necessarily or anything because you're out there every day. But if you would have to maybe pick two or three of your best flies over the last couple of years and maybe three or four of your best flashers, over the last couple of years, what would they be? I mean, ones that you would say guys at home should just absolutely have. Boy, I'd say studs. I mean, the blue stud, the green stud. I mean, just they are. I know. Just I know home. you love the. I know you love the Mountain Dew stud because you call that better than Alex. Yeah. By the way, Alex is your first yes. mate. That's what you call it, better than Alex, right? So we, you love all three of those, yeah. then. Right. I mean, we catch them on all three of them, but probably if I had to pick one stud, it's going to be the Mountain Dew stud. Uh, flies, I mean, there's, I don't run a ton of, I, I mean, I run a lot of different ones, but I mean, it's pretty much the standard stuff that, uh, it's all salmon candy. Obviously I run nothing but salmon candy, but all the flies seem to work at different times. I mean, I don't, I just don't try and get too tied up with the same fly. I was so terrible at that one time, at one time in my uh, career, which isn't that long ago, that I was so stubborn I wouldn't take a fly off. I mean, it, it could go stone dead, but I'm like, no, don't take it off of that flasher. I just, we, I, it worked, and I get so stubborn that way that I won't switch. Now we do, so we switch a lot more flies, and half the time I can't even remember three days ago what that fly was even working back then because we've switched it six times. I mean, it's just, it's the flies are, I mean, they're, they're great. I mean, all of them seem to work. I don't uh, think I have a personal favorite one as far as, I mean, I don't, you know, it seems like they, uh, they all seem to work at their times, different times. And it seems to definitely, definitely seems to be uh, uh, more green early in the season. I know you think green seems to work later in the season. We were having that discussion last year, and you told me that that was. I said the fly was great early, and you were like, "No, no, it wasn't. It was uh, better all year." And I'm like, oh, "It doesn't seem that way for me." Well, and that's just the interesting part, right? I mean, it's not. It's not always the same for everybody. Um, so you don't have a really preferred one. I mean, I know you love Mercy UV. I know that. I know you love Illumination. I mean, would you say those two stand out for you? Or, I mean, or, I mean, again, because yeah, I don't fish I mean, with you a lot anymore. I mean, it's Illumination. Obviously, is one of my all-time favorites. And No Mercy and Mercy Flies are probably those three are probably the the biggest for my for me. I mean, you probably will find those on my rods almost all the time in a mix. But uh, there's a lot of great flies that we make, or you make, uh, I should say. But uh, those three are definitely the high. I mean, if I was to pick three flies to go out and start fishing with, those three flies would probably be the three flies I would run. 
And now, I, I know mean, that I know over the years you've caught a lot of fish on Megatron. I know that's one of your favorite flashers as well. I mean, I'm assuming that had to be hot for you the last couple of years because it seems like it was hot for everybody. It was uh, a couple of years ago. It was super hot. Last year, it's uh, it was all right, but it wasn't great. I mean, to be honest with you, we caught a lot of fish on studs last year. It just seemed like it just seemed like that was what they wanted. We caught, uh, I mean, a better what I call better than Alex, which is the Mountain Dew stud is. Uh, I mean, I got that thing on there pretty much every day, all day. I mean, and you were running two of those last day. year, weren't you? Yes. I mean, we ran two, even three at times. I mean, but uh, yeah, I, that's if I had to pick one flasher that probably stood out the last two years for me, it's that one. I mean, it's been it's been really good. I mean, I love Mountain Dew early in the season. I've always been a big believer in Mountain Dew when the water's cold early in the season. Way back, way back early 2000s i mean uh mountain dew flasher eight inch flasher and at that time we were using howie flies but just a standard howie fly an eight inch flasher mountain dew flasher in 40 foot of water was just like a wrecking crew and then as the water warmed in june as the water got warmer it died out it didn't seem to do as well now it seems the mountain dew stud it seems a really has worked all year for the last two years for me I mean, it seems yeah. later in the season, you get into August, it might be a little bit more of the, the white blades, but I have not had a ton of luck last year on white blades. A lot of guys did, but I sure didn't. Yeah, and see, that's what's interesting. I had a ton of luck on white blades in, in Samarama through August, you know, mid-July through August. But but what I think makes Mountain Dew Stud so much more special than the Blue Stud and the Chrome Stud, uh, which is the green version, is that I think it's so much more of a well-rounded multi-species blade which is why i think you do so well on it because you're a charter fisherman and your job is to catch fish so you don't i mean ultimately you don't care i mean you you know everybody wants to catch 25 pound king but you don't care if it's a eight pound steel at a six pound coho a 12 pound king a six pound lake or whatever and i think mountain dew for whatever reason um is just a well-rounded color it catches everything um in comparison to maybe blue or green might be more king specific or steelhead specific or whatever um but mountain dew in general one thing i wanted to mention was we talked about innovation and i don't think a lot of people at home maybe know this i haven't i haven't talked about this a lot but over the course of the last it's got to be getting close to 20 years now you, you know really you and i together and then with guys like maybe dumper dan and, and jay torkey and a couple others have developed a lot of the color patterns that are used today on, on some of the most popular flashers and most popular brands. People don't realize that, you know, some of the most popular spin doctors, I saw two main Michigan charter captains put a post out there, a video saying that the dragon slayer was their best color. Um, you know, things like the stud series, Megatron, Kryptonite, um, two face, Lance's two face, uh, and so on and so forth. And PK special and Charlie special. And I mean, we could talk about this for 20 minutes and I could keep naming them. Back in the early 2000s, I had this crazy idea where I got this machine that, that cut tape and, and we were putting tape on lures and, you know, that came back from you and Dumper tape and spoons and then turned into me really taking it into flashers. Uh, you know, anything there in particular that, you know, you feel like, I mean, do you feel like what Salmon Candy does and some of the other brands do now with this big assortment, do you feel like you need that big assortment? I mean, is that help your fishing? I mean, obviously, to some extent, I want to kind of put words in your mouth and say it does because you didn't have the stud series two years ago and you just said the stud series was your oddest series. So, I mean, maybe talk a little bit about that. As a charter guy who could probably buy unlimited amounts of stuff and feel like you could use it, how important is it to have a pretty decent selection, a pretty wide selection of flashers and flies? I think it's uh, pretty pretty darn important. We've talked about it, you know, with the other captains, and we say, you know, the problem with with a lot of guys, including myself, we get we get a little bit too too set in our ways, and we have like a. I used to laugh at guys that say, "This is my starting lineup, and I put this out every day. This is what I start with every day." I used to laugh at them and say, you know, what it is. But the problem is when you go out a lot, you start to have that. You start to get in that. And I have to break myself off from that and say, you know, hey, you know, I can, you know I've been running this for a couple of days and it's not done anything. It's I'm not putting it out anymore. It's very important to have a lot of different flashers. We just got done touched for a second on the white flashers later in, you know, in my opinion, later July, August, white flashers generally dominate and there are so many different color variations and things i mean you can have 
green water, blue, you know, they talk about water being where the water is very clear and it's been extremely clear, but we do have seen uh, green water the last few years, which changes a lot of colors and what they what was working in the blue water versus the green water. I think you have to have uh, an ample amount of different color blades. I honestly think, to be honest with you, you need, if you're going to have 20 flashers, I'd rather have you have you know, 15 different ones and a couple of doubles of your favorites versus having 20 flashers and, and only three different colors. I mean, you have to, you have to be able to mix it up. I mean, and, and I mean, it makes it just as, just as bad as, I mean, a good thing and bad thing, great for salmon candy, but, uh, you know, is social media now. I mean, social media, you know, just about the time you think you got something figured out, you hear that, uh, you hear that, uh, a uh, new flasher and it's just hotter than heck. So are you going to tell me you're not going to go out and buy that? I know I am. I mean, I have so many flashers. I literally just, I don't even know where to put them anymore. And, you know, you got to get off that. I, and I'm, I'm notorious for this of being getting lazy as I call it. And just, you know, running the same stuff over and over again until someone tells me, Oh, I've been catching them on this and I'll switch and take off something that's been not very productive to begin with, but I'm just stubborn and won't want to take it off. But yeah, I think you have to, you have to have many, many different uh, colors and variations and you have to be able to use them. You can't be stubborn and say, well, I've caught 10 fish this year or 10 fish in the last week on this flasher. And now it's gone. It just go. I mean, it's just bizarre. It'll go stone dead. I mean, just stone dead. It just won't catch any more fish. So if you don't have a variety of colors, I mean, you need, I would, like I said, if you're going to have 20 flashers, I'd rather have 15 different colors and a couple of my favorites doubled up versus having uh, only six or seven colors and having four of each one. Yeah, I want to talk, hit a couple more topics here before we get done. Um, I want to talk about one more thing that you've taught me immensely over the years that I would say is as valuable as how to set up and where to set up. Um and again, it's not a sexy conversation that I think people at home are probably not going to think this is the greatest thing in the world, but uh, probably it was much more fun to talk about Mountain Dew Stud and Blue Stud than it is going to be about this, but this will put more fish in your boat as well, and it's significant, and that is you taught me how to catch fish. And what I mean by that is people think when they say how to catch fish, it means how to hook them on your line. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how to catch them once you get them on the rod. You're very particular and very adamant about what your mates do and how they do things with the charter customer. And more importantly, I think things have changed dramatically from when I was a mate to today on how you guys treat the, how you fight the fish is what I'm getting at. How you treat the rod and reel when you fight the fish and how you fight them. Why don't you talk a little bit about the angle of the rod, the consistent pressure, some of the things that I try to talk about with guys. Because what do you see out there? You see a lot of these guys grab a rod, they think they're bass fishing and they're they're heavy pumping and going like this. And then they wonder why they're lucky if they catch 50% of the fish they get on. Talk a little bit about that for two or three minutes and try to help a few people at home get more in the boat once they get them on. You used to tell me real quickly, you used to tell me when I was a kid, one on the rod's worth 10 in the lake. And that was an important thing I've taken with me my whole life. Yep, I always say that. Uh, yeah, we kind of, uh, over the years, I mean, back way back when we did a lot of the pumping, dropping the rod, and, uh, you know, trying to catch the fish that way. And what we found out, uh, obviously, you know, we kind of refined it over the years, and especially once flashers became relevant, you know, really relevant in the catch, you know, we figured out that uh, – by not dropping the rod, trying to stay, keep it at a 45 degree angle and a steady crank and adjust the drag accordingly. Well, as a first mate, I'll adjust the drag accordingly. And uh, seems to work because when you start dropping the rod with a flasher and you give it slack, what does that flasher want to do? It wants to spin and it spins, it pulls line and, and the flasher is pulling itself against itself all the time. So we found that we just flat out 45 degree angle reel. We don't say this one has a flasher. We want you to reel it in this way. This one has a spoon. You can reel it in this way. We've just found that 45 degree angle and, and constant pressure and slowly reeling the fish in. You know, obviously you have to fight the fish a little bit, but uh, 
you know, let it go when it's going to run and stuff like that, you know, obviously, but you don't want to pull back on it at all. We try not to do any pulling back or any uh, lowering the rod. We want to keep it at a 45 until we get it behind the boat, and we may tell them to lift the rod or we may tell them to lower the rod, depending on what kind of fish it is and while it's coming in and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's just I, what we have, what I learned, what I learned a long time ago is, uh, coaching i mean cut you know too many you see too many guys charter boats private guys whatever they're taking their buddy out or it's a charter and their people the people get on the boat they fish once a year on lake michigan or maybe never have fished before and you know the first mate's back there we get a fish on or a bite and the guy grabs a rod and he you know he says who's up and hands them the rod rather quickly and gives them no instruction from there and the fish gets off because he didn't, you know, he might have pulled back or didn't reel fast enough. You know, we give instructions while we're going down the river on, you know, you know, how to, how that, what we expect them to do once we get the fish on so that we're not trying to explain it to them when we're handing them the rod. You know, and, you know, it's a customer's fish. If he really decides he wants to fight it a different way, we're not going to argue with him. But we're just trying to get the fish in the boat, and that's what I tell him. That's why we do the coaching. And it used to, we used to laugh because so many mates would just throw the rod at the customer, not say a word, and the fish would get off. And I was always telling my mates, I've always told my mates, I said, you know what? We got we to gotta work twice as hard for half as many bites, so we better get the ones we got on in. If we get the ones we got on in, we're always going to have as many fish as everybody else. But if we don't catch those fish, we don't get as many bites as everybody else, we're not going to do, do very well. And, I mean, a lot of the other charters, especially the other Dumper Dan guys, now they all do coaching for the most part. I mean, in, you know, I, when I say coaching, I mean instructions when you have it on the rod, you know, helpful instructions, not, you know, yelling and screaming at a customer or, even your buddy on a weekend, you know, helpful instructions, I mean, you know, can be a lot. People, you know, people can't, you can't expect people that don't go out there very often to know all the ins and outs of how to reel a fish in. And a lot of them are too proud or afraid to ask. So, you know, it, by doing this, I think that we've just increased our, our amount of fish we catch has just almost doubled by, uh, by helping them out coaching and, you know, talking to them before we get out there so that they know what to expect so they're not just you know handed a rod they have no idea what what to expect what to do anything else and, and all of a sudden it's too late and they're like well what did i do wrong and the, you know the customer or ca i mean the first mate or captain goes well you didn't reel you know, like did somebody tell me i was supposed to reel yeah exactly you know? i i tell a lot of people this and i and i've always meant this in a lighted way but in a true way you were really hard on me when i was a kid when i when you tried to teach me things about fishing but you did that on purpose to try to make me a better fisherman and i always knew if we lost one and i wasn't standing right there it, i wouldn't get the rod back in you'd be back there and all you would do is come up right next to me and you'd very quietly go will you please coach him on the next one so he can catch it and you'd turn around and walk back up to the wheel but i knew it's kind of like when you make a bad pass and you're the point guard and you turn it over, you know, you deserve it because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Um, segueing into that to kind of wrap some of the things up that I think are important. I get asked all the time. I've been asked this hundreds of times. You've probably been asked it thousands of times. What makes you a great fisherman? Why can you win tournaments, things like that? And I tell them all the time, the things my dad has taught me over the years are the little things. The big things everybody figures out. You know, everybody figures out how to put a flasher and fly on their rod. Everybody figures out how to get wire line setups or copper setups. It's the little things that make a big difference. What direction you set up in the morning, how you fight your fish, how you set your dipsy with your drag instead of free spool. Um, you know, what kind of swivels do you use? Uh, you know, all check your line every time you're done or every time you catch a fish. You know how many guys put their baits back in the water and don't check their line or, or put their flash or fly back out, then check the fly lead and snap it off the next time? Um, you know, check your knots after you catch a fish or two, uh, you know, all kinds of little things, maybe talk just for a minute. Those are, again, are not things that are going to stand out, but what are some of the, you know, your processes you go through every charter to make sure that that next charter, you give them the best opportunity. Because I remember before I hand it to you, I remember one other thing you taught me about charter fishing and it was really important. And this will stick with me for the rest of my life. The next group, 
paid just as much money as the group before. So they deserve the same opportunity as they did to catch fish. So just because you caught them in the morning, you can't get lazy in the afternoon and stop checking stuff and, th- and changing baits and things like that because they deserve the same chance that the guys did in the morning. Yeah, there's so many of those little things that make a difference. But uh, I, have had a, I have a first mate named Alex that's been with me for many, many years. And, I mean, I know I was hard on him when he first started. It was – you know, he was, it was pretty tough on him, but he learned a lot. And, uh, I mean, you know, checking lines is just, I mean, such a basic thing, but check the lines before you ever leave the dock or put a rod in the water. You know how many times I, that he's changed, a, changed the leader or I've changed a leader before we ever left the dock that we went to, we pulled the rods out of the cabin and we ran our hand down the line on a leader on a slide diver or, or the, uh, from the swivel to the tip of the rod on a downrigger or a board rod that we found a fray, cut it off and redid it. I mean, you know, that's one of the few things that uh, people don't do and they get out there and they get a, a big fish, a nice fish that might be their only fish and they put it out there with a whole bunch of frayed line and snapped it off. I mean, we don't lose a ton of lures, but, you know, and but we check them before we leave. Every single fish, I mean, I... I grill that into my mates every single fish when you're going to put the lure back out run your finger up at least three feet up the line your two fingers up the line and feel if there's any frays or any nicks or anything like that because it can happen in the net the fish around the fish's head and you put it out there and that that bait that's been working now snapped off and you lost it and now the next four hours may be really slower or slower because we didn't have that bait and we just lost it on foolish mistakes just like coaching is, you know, a ton of things. I mean, I, you know, you made that comment and, you know, I have always done that with all my mates. If we're not coaching, I'll come back there and I'll mention it to the mate, you know, quietly. Mention it. You know, yeah, mention it. Mention it that we might want to try coaching the people so that we get some of these fish in. But uh, the biggest thing that I can tell you is it's a, you know, over everybody's looking for the secret lure and the secret setup and all that stuff is very important. But there's so many little things that doesn't cost any money that you can do, and that's attention to detail. I mean, so many times I've seen guys, you know, they they set a slide diver and they catch a fish on it, and they have no idea how far that lead was out. They have they can't duplicate it because they didn't they didn't even pay attention to how far it was out to begin with. And I'm not just talking from the diver to the rod tip and looking at the line counter. I'm talking a length of leader. Some guys go by by. Uh, by what they call poles where they're pulling the line out like this i used to do that but we don't do that anymore i go by the line counter itself i'm trying to get that exact and i mean this story just came up the other day one of the captains the first time he ever first made it for me we went out and we're fishing the harbor mouse in september and on my hottest rod was a slide diver with a plug on it and he went to set that rod grabbed that rod and i saw him going like this and I looked at him and I go, did you look at the line counter at all before you did that? He goes, no, I just zeroed it out. And I just went off the deep end. We had that diver set on a certain specific amount of line set out and it was out so far and it had been basically the catching most of our fish for the, the, the prior week and just completely wiped out. We had no idea what it was and I couldn't remember what it was set at. I think it was at 67 feet, but I don't know. He just said I put it out 13 poles and I mean, I just, I'm I'm attention to detail. So many little things. If you're going to set a downrigger, we use rubber bands and we try and set them exactly back to where they've been, you know, prior to, you know, that lead. And I mean, you know, <laughs> with, you know, the old uh, story Dan's probably told you and you guys learned what Dan and taught you I mean looking for the bump in the line where a rubber band had been so that if the rubber band's gone we can find that exact setup but the biggest thing in, in salmon fishing is repeatability you want to be able to repeat things exactly as they were not you know there's so much of ah oh, it was somewhere around 60 feet I thought the leader was I want to know exact because it worked I want to repro- I want to you know reproduce that exactly the way it was hopefully it's going to work again just so many little details that you can do that make your make fishing so much better for you just kind of to finish up here first of all thanks for taking the time to join us again this is the morning buzz with russell's fishing tech we got uh, captain george gahagan from dumper dan charters who also happens to be my dad uh on with us and we're finishing up here what's been a one of my favorite uh morning buzz episodes so far but kind of kind of to just wrap this whole thing together you've been fishing your entire life 
you fished walleye tournaments, you fished salmon tournaments. Um, maybe tell maybe tell a story. I did the same thing with Dumper. I did the same thing with Nate. If you had to pick a story, um, one of one of your favorite fishing tournament stories or even charter trip stories um, of a successful outing or whatever the case may be, maybe what would that be? Uh, it, I think it's always fun to kind of end it on that. Dumper, Dumper told a couple stories. Uh, Nate's told some. It's your turn to maybe tell one. Well, I mean, I have literally thousands and thousands of interesting, funny, and not so funny and terrible stories. I mean, of charter fishing, tournament fishing, but you have to understand one thing. I've grown up my entire my entire uh, life fishing Lake Michigan. So when I got a chance to get away and did a little walleye fishing, I super enjoyed that because it was something different. And it got to the point in, in salmon fishing that when I went and fished a tournament in salmon fishing, it was kind of, it kind of was either you had to win or, or it wasn't any good. Second place wasn't any good. You know, they expected, oh, he only took second. Oh, you know, he's terrible. He had a bad tournament. He's washed up because he took third or fifth or seventh, you know, because he didn't win. Where I went into the sand, uh, I did some, we did some walleye fishing. We were basically nobodies. Nobody knew us. Nobody thought we were any good at anything. So I guess, and it just was that type of thing really was a great change of pace for me. So I guess maybe my favorite of all time is going to be a MWC championship that we ended up finishing third in. Uh, lost, uh, lost by less than a pound. Uh, I lost a couple fish in that tournament that probably may have put us right there. I mean, but that, that three-day tournament right there was probably one of the highlights of my career, and it's walleye fishing versus salmon fishing. I mean, salmon fishing, like I said, I've done all my life, and I probably take it for granted, and which is a bad thing because I don't realize how much, how, you know, how well I have it. So many guys would just love to be able to, you know, go out and spend that much time fishing for salmon. And I do enjoy it, don't get me wrong, but I mean, the change of pace thing in tournament fishing, as far as the story goes, it would have to be those three days up up uh, at the walleye tournament on the Mississippi River, you know, was with you as my partner and the NWC was probably one of the more exciting things. I mean, right down to the last day, we didn't know we were going to win or lose. I mean, we were right there. It's unfortunate that on the second day, we only weighed four fish and, and it kind of hurt us a little bit. That's probably in my top couple as well. I, I give, uh, I, I share usually three stories that I feel like are, are important to me. Um, there, I've got hundreds of them like that as well, but that would be one of them. Uh, taking second in the NWT, which again is, uh, is, is, it's tough to take second, but, but it's interesting because I have the same exact philosophy as you. And we talk about this, you and I once in a while, and sometimes I need a little slap to, to wake up, but I hear more about the times guys beat Russell than I do Russell wins just because I've, I've been blessed and I've had my share of success. Um, but that NWT event, nobody even really knew who I was. And a few guys that did know who I was, you know, were obviously didn't probably give me, you know, the opportunity to take second or maybe have a chance to win that thing. I stood on the stage for hours. I mean, I was in at 11 o'clock and stood on the stage for four hours before it was over um, with an opportunity to win before Corey beat me with, a, you know, one of the last guys to weigh in. Those two, and then I would say, you know, one that still is is one that's really been important to me is the, the one Salmon Cup year that you led on day one, and we had a program together that I found up in Manitowoc that we went up together and fished, and you just straight up out fished me on day one. And then day two, we were able to win um, the event, uh, having just an awesome day. But it was the first year in, in a boat, the pursuit um, with kind of my, you know, my daughter on the team, Sammy on the team. It was important to me that you were up there. We were fishing that program together. You were leading. You know, I think you ended up third or fourth in that event. Um, we just had a, you know, it, that all came together at really the right time, and it meant a whole bunch of things to me. Um, those have been some of my most fun stories over the years that you know you and I have been part of. But it's always interesting because as a father, you know, I'm always going to you to tell you, right. I called you right away when I got off the boat on the MWT to tell you I'm limited out at 1130. You know, I call you on the salmon cup, you know, to see what I need to do to try to, to get a fish. I mean, even this year, you know, you came out in your midday charter on the salmon cup and I'm struggling, I'm grinding, trying to just catch a fish. And then I'll never forget we're powering in. Uh, and, and you're like, 
you called me and you're like, what's going on? You're running late. You're going like, you know, going crazy trying to get in. What happened? You must've got one. And, and we got that big one at the end and ended up winning the tournament. But, you know, we've had so many memories over the years, dad, of, of last second fish or, or the big fish that, that helped us, you know, in that championship, I, you know, you caught 90% of the fish that weekend. I don't even think I caught a handful of fish, but I caught that one big one, you know, that ended up being the big fish of the tournament. We won a bunch of money for that. And, you know, so it's just fun, those stories that we'll never be able to forget, you know, they've been a lot of fun over the years. Um, and it's been really enjoyable. So one more time, thank you very much, Captain George Gahagan from Dumper Dan no. Charters. Uh, this oh, is can I see one more thing, Russell? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I did bring up what I, when you asked me about stories, uh, I told you a good one, but you know, what I always, me and you just had this discussion a couple of days ago about good versus, uh, you know, fishermen that uh, we all, I always said a, a great fisherman. The first thing that comes to his mind when you ask him a story is a tournament he lost that bothers him because he lost that tournament. Most guys that, you know, they talk about their accolades on what they've won. I've always, it's always bothered me when I lost the tournament. When you brought up that tournament in Manitowoc that I led on, uh, there's two salmon cups I fished that I led on the first day and didn't, it wasn't able to finish it. Those, those stick in my mind more than any tournament I've won because I feel like I, I had it right there and I didn't finish. I made a mistake. And that's what makes a great fisherman, I think. I think when they worry about how they're going to take care of the next thing or how they can get better, it makes them a great fisherman. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I talk a lot about this to guys that are really detailed with tournament fishing or ask me questions. I related our Anglers Avenue team as the Buffalo Bills, and you know this, and you already know where I'm going with this. We went mm-hmm. to four straight Salmon Showdown championships and lost four times in a row. And you know better than anybody because I spent not – hours but probably a hundred hours on the telephone with you trying to figure out how to win a salmon showdown championship because i knew our time was limited we only had so much time um because i knew that that thing wasn't going to last forever and you know just like you and i fishing the mwc championship i was proud that we were able to make it four years in a row but we were never able to get the job done and that's going to last forever for me unfortunately you know i'm always going to remember the fact that we just couldn't win the big one uh in that particular series in that particular event um so you're 100 percent right there but thankfully we've got lily and hopefully she can carry on the gang and tradition and uh you know maybe she can i i agree i think she's got a lot better chances so uh this is the morning buzz with russell's fishing tech uh episode 13 brought to you by torquey coffee and uh we got captain george gagan from dumper dan charters uh you can find russell's fishing tech on youtube just ch- just type in Russell's Fishing Tech. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And uh, don't be afraid to uh, follow Dumper Dan Charters on Facebook. You'll see lots of pictures of Captain George catching lots of fish in 2022. Thanks again, Dad. You bet. Thank you. Thank you.